Hello, everybody, um, to the panel on green public procurement that we're having today, um, hosted by the Society for Benefit Cost Analysis. We will be talking about different legal and regulatory aspects, but also about measuring sustainability and different approaches how to do so. I would first like to introduce our um, panelists and members um, whom I would like to warmly thank for joining us today. Um, first of all, we will have uh, Steven Schooner um, talking about um, the US um, or the American perspective on government purchasing. And um, he's a professor of public procurement law at George Washington University for many years. Um, he's very, he's published many, many works about um, uh, public procurement, efficiency, goals, um, and, and many more, many more things that, that he will inspire us today. Then we have uh, Roberto Caranda from um, the University of Turin. Um, I saw he's also at um, the Georgetown University now in, um, in a program. And he is professor of administrative law and he will be talking today mostly about um, life cycle costing from an EU perspective. And I thank him very much for being here um, despite the um, daylight saving issue he was able to jump on um, a little earlier. Same goes for Mark Steiner um, from Switzerland. He is judge at the Swiss Federal um, Administrative Court, which deals with, uh, with administrative matter matters. And he is an expert in public procurement. Um, this is why um, he is here today and will be speaking about competition based on price versus competition based on quality and how this plays into green public procurement. I will first give a brief introduction about international approaches that we see um, and then I will also um, mention since we are here at the Society for Benefit Cost Analysis how um, are my thoughts and idea about um, measuring sustainability. I have written a paper about this um, which is measuring what matters in public procurement and I have attached a link here. I can also, if someone is interested later, uh, post it in the chat or um, you can also write me an email to the address that you're seeing here. So um, first I want to briefly um, give an introduction, um, mostly because we, our audience is both lawyers and economists, and um, I will just um, start from, from, from the beginning and, and, and ask why do we want to regulate sustainability? And this just as a quick heads up. Um, the reason is that we have two sorts um, of failures, at least from an economic perspective. We have market failure and we have government failure. And the reason why um, we want to re uh, regulate sustainability is mostly market failure. And we confront those types of failure in public procurement. But today we would like to focus on the market failure of um, external externalities or negative externalities such as pollution. And um, the theory behind this is that um, these externalities are not accounted for in the market, meaning that they don't have a market value and no one bears the costs. So a firm can um, pollute into the environment without paying um, any, any cost uh, for that. So it's sort of a uh, similar to a public good, but but not exactly the same. But we can think about in that in that matter. So these externalities are also um, linked to um, the so-called property rights um, coast theorem. The coast is a is a economist um, that you might all know, who has talked about um, to how to better define property rights, um, and seeing that in uh, zero trend transaction cost uh, environment um, with perfectly defined property rights, we would not encounter externalities. However, real life looks very different. We have externalities, we have costs, and we are looking to internalize um, those costs 
through regulation and other means. And this is what we're talking um, today. So there are different approaches and um, today public procurement law mostly focuses on the regulatory instrument to correct and to internalize um, these externalities. Um, there, um, this approach is also called command and control because um, these are mandatory rules. However, um, as we will see um, in today's discussion, um, not all those rules are mandatory in public procurement. They're also optional rules. And this is where we encounter um, also some, some sort of problems since not all the contractors are um, forced um, to, um, to apply sustainability criteria only if the government chooses to apply so. And especially Mark will talk about the new regulation that we have in Switzerland, which um, should encourage, um, and then the question is, or even um, require government agencies to um, include such sustainability criteria into public contracting. Um, just um, to broaden up the window and to think um, kind of um, in the larger um, picture, we also have market-based instruments to address those kind of issues and behavioral economics. And um, I would just like to, to mention um, some examples um, to, to kind of inspire um, the thinking what we could do in public procurement here. Um, we have like the Pecuvian tax that you might know, um, all know which taxes um, negative behavior. And um, um, I will dwell into this a little later, but we could have a tax on people or contractors who are not delivering um, a sustainable project and how we might um, integrate this is, is, for example, in the evaluation of a contract um, that might get or score higher when a sustainable um, contract is provided instead of a non-sustainable. Um, other ideas are incentives, um, incentive contracts, for example, for performance-based uh, contracting, where we uh, want to achieve certain sustainability goals and, and, and where um, this can be put into a contract and force the contractor, the private firm, to um, obtain to these uh, performance and target goals. Um, these are two ideas under the market-based instruments um, that, I, that I had, and um, two others under behavioral economics are, for example, disclosure rules, so that um, the government might choose to publish which contractors and which contracts were sustainable um, or chose a sustainable process and who did not. So as we know, disclosure can have many effects um, in terms of disciplining um, contractors and private firms. And other idea would be um, default rules, also known under the Nudge theory. And here I was thinking into the direction of requiring contracts to be sustainable from the outset and to let the contractor opt out if they want to. We know from research that opting out um, is often uh, done reluctantly because um, players are often lazy to opt out. Um, and, and finally, moral suasion, I found um, as a very new economic theory, or not new actually, but I discovered it newly, is, mo is described as an attempt to coerce private economic activity, in our case, these would be private firms and contractors, via governmental exhortation. So the government is involved here, the public agencies, um, where, where it is not already required and directed by law, so where we don't have mandatory um, laws. And, and this could be kind of a, an interim solution or a kind of a in between the lines between mandatory regulation and um, behavioral um, and economics and disclosure rules. So this is a more, was a more conceptual um, discussion of um, how we could regulate and how we can um, integrate um, externalities. And then now I want to come how it, um, to, to get to the point how it looks like in public procurement. Um, so public procurement has mostly selected approach of regulatory instruments. So we have laws and regulations that require or um, at least encourage um, private firms and contractors to um, obey um, sustainability requirements. And I will come to the international 
development very soon. So we have in public procurement law um, three um, instruments that I uh, will consider are relevant when we um, think about integrating um, negative externalities, especially in the environmental sphere. Selection criteria are the criteria um, on, on the basis of which governments and agencies choose um, different contractors. And here we have the chance to, for example, integrate I, um, ISO standards, which uh, require sustainable management in terms of a company. So this would be kind of one entry door into how we can require contractors to, um, to um, respect and integrate sustainable um, criteria. Then we have the award criteria, which are the criteria on the basis of which um, the public agencies choose and award um, the contract, so tender the contract. And um, here we have the concept of the most advantageous tender, and I will come um, in a bit um, how we got to this um, new, I would say, at least from a Swiss perspective, um, um, kind of, uh, I would say, a definition or term, uh, which includes a lot of, or which uh, entails a lot of content. Um, and um, there we have, um, to prove or to provide evidence for fulfilling these award criteria, we um, have uh, labels, we have echo labels, we have, for example, FSC standards. This is a wood certificate standard um, that, that like uh, wood is harvested in a sustainable way. We have LEED certificates. Um, this is especially known or relevant in the United States for, for sustainable um, and construction work. And under those award criteria, um, we also have newly um, introduced the life cycle costing. In the EU public procurement um, directives thin, since 2014, this means that um, we not only consider the costs at that one moment in time where the contract is awarded, but we consider and follow the life cycle of a certain product um, construction or service, mostly products, um, I would say. So we look into that, we cover um, and, and take into account and internalize the cost of acquisition, the cost of use and maintenance costs. And this maintenance cost aspect is really important since oftentimes we only think about the construction, for example, of a building and do not consider um, how efficiently, energy efficiently it will be run um, over the lifetime um, of, of that building, let's say hundred years. And then we also can consider the recycling of those um, of those products and the recycling costs. But I will let the floor um, about life cycle costing in more detail to Roberto uh, later. Um, in Switzerland, um, just to give you some numbers and ideas, um, there was a reporting set published by the Swiss Federal Council, which is the, which is the Swiss president, um, so to say, consisting of seven members. Um, in 2007 that um, said that 95% of construction um, contracts already require sustainability. And I was surprised because when I uh, go into the database, I uh, do not see uh, sustainability criteria in 95% of cases. So I wonder where this number is coming from. And, and in my research, I'm testing this number. Um, and my assumption is they were looking into 22 uh, tenders and um, um, I think it was 17 out of them had the sustainability criterion. And as the statistician may know, an economist, you cannot um, draw a number um, that is significant on the basis of 22 data points. So this is uh, one idea that I had. And then um, in the EU, um, we have a report from the CEPS, um, so the Environmental uh, Protection uh, program, I think, and um, they um, found that um, in a study um, between 2009 and 10, 26% of contracts included GPP, um, as a green public procurement criteria, and 38% of contract value included um, green public procurement criteria. I think these numbers are more realistic um, than uh, the ones that we got from um, Switzerland. Although um, I think um, I, I still would say um, it is a, 
a generous um, a generous view um, that about around 30 uh, one third is already sustainable so so much about this and then lastly we also have the technical specification in public procurement where we can um, introduce um, or require sustainable uh, production process for example and um, these come very close to performance requirements um, so and in most regulations, and this is more of an overview of the different regulations that are looked at, Switzerland, EU, and US. So it's not like um, uh, very specific to only one region, but it is, uh, I noticed these commonalities uh, across different areas. And what I also noticed is that um, these uh, rules and regulations are oftentimes still optional and not mandatory. Um, so on this leads me, I'm checking the time. This leads me to um, what were the international efforts in and, and also regional and finally national um, efforts um, to, to this sustainability criterion in uh, public procurement. At the international level, we have the WTO government procurement agreement, as all um, experts uh, certainly know. And in 1994 uh, version, we have the notion of most advantageous tender. Sustainability, however, is not explicitly mentioned. This changes into in the 2012 version, where um, we have a, a mentioning um, of work programs for sustainable procurement that the governments so, should foster sustainable, uh, sustainability and sustainable procurement. Um, however, this is more of a shawl, uh, like a more of a, a encouraging notion than anything uh, mandatory. Then on the EU level, um, we have the public procurement directives. The one in 2004 asks for the most economically advantageous tender or meet as uh, many experts refer to. And um, in the recitals, um, there is a mentioning of sustainable development. Um, however, sustainability is still in the background and gets more prominent in the directive version of 2014. In that version, we have the award criteria, which um, newly requires um, the price quality ratio and um, also um, allows the public agencies to include environmental aspects into the awarding of contracts. So here we are in the award criteria area. And then we also have principles in Article 76, where member states may, however, we have a may here, um, rely on best quality ratio, taking into account sustainability criteria. In the US, and um, here, of course, uh, Stephen knows a lot more, but what I found out is that in 2011, the FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, has sustainable, sustainable acquisition policies introduced. And um, here's a very interesting um, sentence um, from, from um, part 23, which says that federal agencies shall advance sustainable acquisition by ensuring that 95% of new contract actions require that the products are energy efficient. So this, the wording might, um, might um, lead towards the impression that this is all mandatory. We have shawl, we have ensure, we have require, but Steve will probably tell you soon that this um, is not um, quite like this in practice. Um, then in Switzerland, we have um, an act, Public Procurement Act from 1994, um, that was still referring to the most economically advantageous tender. And the, pro the problem with this was that the focus was lying on economic, and oftentimes agencies would um, not choose to uh, other criteria, for example, sustainability, even though it was mentioned. So they mostly focus on the economic aspect. And this has changed now with a new law that was adopted January this year, to, um, 2021, where um, the agencies can um, or shall award um, the contract based on the most advantageous tender. So we have these economically um, no longer included in the definition. And uh, we also have a specific reference to life cycle costing now and sustainability, but Mark uh, will know a lot more. 
what I found out and what I would like to uh, briefly cover is um, the Japanese law. So I found out that um, Jap Japan has been the first um, jurisdiction which introduced um, a mandatory sustainability requirement into public procurement in 2001. And this made me very curious um, um, and I will look at it right after this slide um, as, as a case study and see and ask the question whether and how effective this mandatory approach of sustainability was. But before, I would briefly like to, um, to go into the measuring um, questions. So this relates back to uh, the paper that I've written on measuring what matters in public procurement and I pick out the sustainability question here. So what I did um, in my paper is that um, we have certain goals in public procurement law. We have the best value for money, for example, and there we have two aspects. We have value, quality, and money, uh, the price. And what we subsume under um, value um, has not been like limited or defined. So I personally would subsume sustainability as one aspect of quality. But of course, um, we have different opinions, um, but I see Mark is agreeing. So I, I'm glad at least from, uh, from a Swiss perspective, this is, um, this, is, um, this is how we approach it. And then we, um, I have defined um, quantify benefits, which is an interim step to um, go to monetize benefits. So whenever we want to, and the folks from the cost benefit analysis, they know that we need an interim step to first understand, like for example, um, how many tenders um, include life cycle costing. And then we have a number attached to this. And then the question is how much do we save? How much cost do we save with life cycle costing? And then we get um, the monetary um, term attached to it. And as soon as we have the monetized benefit, we can um, compare costs and um, benefits against each other and see um, which, um, which, um, so, or which outcome um, we have whether we have a net benefit or whether we have a, a net cost on society with a certain um, regulation. So another way um, uh, how I would quantify um, sustainability is the sustainability weighting. So we often have in the award criteria, um, we often have in the award criteria, the sustainable, sustainable the option at least, um, to have sustainability weighting. So this looks as follows. We can have, for example, 60% price um, that is required for a contract, then 30% uh, quality and 10% sustainability. However, as I mentioned um, earlier, I've never seen more than 10%, at least in Swiss public procurement. And I have rarely seen a sustainability weighting um, used. So these 95% um, um, are really uh, an interesting um, observation of, of the report. Then um, an evidence that we can have to prove um, whether or not a contract um, is actually, or project is actually sustainable are the labels and the green labels. We have different issues attached to this labeling. Um, the first one is local versus international labels. Whenever we have international labels, um, we have access um, or we guarantee access to international corporations to, um, to um, join a, a tendering or award um, process. Um, however, the problem is that small and medium enterprises often cannot um, join and fulfill these international labels. And then we have the local labels who might ex exclude international firms, but allow small and medium firms to join. So this is a kind of a trade-off that we're facing there. And then lastly, um, the infrastructure damages. This is a very interesting approach. I've seen this in the Clean Air Act um, of the United States, where they calculate um, different um, uh, damages of acid rain that may be caused through to pollution to buildings and how um, and these damages are then um, calculated and transferred into um, monetary um, damages. Um, let me quickly see, I saw that we have a comment. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I want to 
take um, only like three minutes to, to wrap this up um, so that everyone has uh, the time to speak. Um, willingness to pay is another instrument to measure um, how much people are willing to pay for, for example, sustainable uh, process or um, sustainable um, um, train. So the question there would be how much are you willing to pay for a ticket riding an energy efficient train versus a non energy efficient. This gives you the monetary value of how much you value, uh, for example, a sustainable versus a non sustainable train. Then we have um, the issue of willingness to pay and willingness to accept, uh, which might differ and um, cost benefit folks um, will, will not on this matter. And then lastly, we have um, the evaluation of health risk. So what does this pollution lead to, to health risk and death? And here we have the value of statistical life that has been estimated by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States as 7.4 million per life saved. So whatever we can save with having um, like non-polluted environments um, will be um, um, multiplied with the number of people who can be saved and um, each life has the value of 7.4 million and then we arrive at the benefit. So this is, this is the theory. Um, I just want to briefly um, point to the Asian um, case study that was interesting uh, about Japan, where uh, we have the mandatory sustainability requirements. We see they have um, they have uh, a spending uh, recorded how much was spent on green public procurement, and they actually reported in Japan um, a CO2 reductions are 400,000 tons. So this would speak towards um, that public procurement, uh, green procurement is effective. And now um, I would um, like to hand over to Steve and the uh, American perspective. I have a couple of leading questions here that we can um, answer later. Steve, um, do you have your own slides? Very good, I stopped sharing. So are my slides up? Perfect. That's good. Okay, I have a thumbs up from Mark. That's great. Uh, first, let me say thanks for including me in this. Uh, also, by way of background, and again, perspective is everything in a program like this, but I've been doing public procurement or what we call government contracts for my entire career. And so when we talk about sustainable procurement, I'm somewhat intrigued that this is a new topic that isn't new but it's new again. And it's a new topic that is incredibly important, but we have a fair number of challenges. So building off of the things that Desiree spoke about, I have relatively limited aspirations for what I'd like to do today, but hopefully I can add a little bit of context before we turn to Roberto and Mark. Okay, so first and foremost, I believe that personally and as a group, we're not here today to debate climate change or to argue about the significance or the need for sustainable procurement. But as I'll get to in a moment, I do think we need to do a better job making the, shall we say, impact or economic or cost benefit argument for why sustainable procurement is so important. Going back to the point that Desiree made just a moment ago, we are struggling in the United States. And I am personally, as someone who's interested in this, struggling to not just initiate, but to some extent accelerate the discussion of sustainable procurement in the United States. It is maddeningly frustrating that in the mid to late 1990s, we were actually doing okay on this. In many ways, we were ahead of the curve we were doing innovative work and the like. But as part of the transition, what was often called the acquisition reform movement in the 1990s in the United States, all of this fell away. And in fact, we removed our most potent regulation from our federal acquisition regulation. So to the extent that Desiree spoke about the formation process and having an evaluation preference for green or sustainable or environmentally preferable solutions, we 
removed that from our regulations in the 1990s. And frankly, we've done little or nothing since. We've done some nice things, energy star lead buildings, green labels and the like, but we haven't done what we could have been doing. As many of you know, the new administration inaugurated just a couple of months ago made climate change one of their highest priorities and that's a good thing. And they have a climate change working group and there's a new executive order on all of these issues. And I think that's good, but I don't quite believe the administration yet appreciates the enormity and the importance of public procurement and sustainable procurement in achieving their goals. For example, the Office of Federal Procurement Policy was not included in the climate change working group. Yes, it's part of the Office of Management and Budget, but that's a massive oversight. And now I want to turn to why that's such a big problem. Now, if you've read the executive order, my fear is it has a little bit of the flaw that we saw in the Obama administration executive orders, which is it tries to do too much and therefore it doesn't do anything. Now, I'm more optimistic about this administration, but the key thing that I want you to take away from today is the scope and scale, the enormous market and the potential impact of sustainable procurement if you want to make progress with regard to climate change. What most non-procurement or non-government experts failure to appreciate today is that in this millennium, let's say last 20, but frankly, the last 30 years, there has been a global outsourcing phenomenon. In other words, governments around the world, in the United States, EU, Asia, South America, Africa, everywhere, governments have increasingly turned to the private sector to help them get the goods, the public works, the construction, the services they need to govern. The trend line on the outsourcing phenomena is staggering. I'll give you a little perspective on that just a moment, but I will talk primarily about the United States federal market because it's one of the largest and most sophisticated and developed in the world, but the same stories are playing out at state and local levels and of course, internationally. But just for complexity in the United States, one big federal government, 50 state governments, innumerable municipal governments, and let's be clear, cities like New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, these are bigger than plenty of countries in the world, but also regional institutions, such as the New York Port Authority, is a staggeringly large public institution. All right, I'll come back to that just in a moment, but the takeaway here is massive impact if you want to change market behavior. All right, for our purposes today, though, the challenge that we have is performance assessment. What gets measured gets managed. We measure the wrong things. And so long as the tyranny of low price dominates procurement, we will struggle to do all of the things that Desiree talked about, which is why so many of us will talk about life cycle cost and rethinking what value for money means. Ultimately, I'll conclude briefly with some change management strategies, because at the end of the day, we are not going to fix this with legislation and regulation. We have to fundamentally change the way government officials, leaders in the private sector think, manage, and act. Okay, a quick story on the numbers here. Don't worry about the nuances of this chart. I just want you to focus on three things. In the United States, federal government, at the turn of the millennia, let's go back to 2001, the United States federal government spent about $200 billion a year in federal procurement. Last year, we spent over $600 billion. So in 20 years, we went from $200 billion a year to over $600 billion a year in goods, services, construction, public work, research, and development. That's the outsourcing trend. And you cannot attribute that to, the infl to inflation. The little line down at the bottom, this would be the growth in federal procurement by rate of inflation during many years, particularly 2000 to 2008 or 2009, procurement spending in the United States increased at five times the rate of inflation. Again, I wanna emphasize, this is just the federal government. 
It does not include the 50 states or the municipalities or the regional institutions. As my colleagues can tell you, EU procurement any given year, over a trillion euros. Again, public procurement is a massive part of the global economy. Many people think we're talking 15 to 22% of global GDP. So the stakes are enormous. Okay, here's your takeaway for the day. If you want to do sustainable procurement, yes, you can legislate, let, yes, you can regulate. But at the end of the day, we need to fundamentally rethink what we're doing in procurement. Because what we know from human behavior is what gets, me what gets measured gets managed. And the problem is in procurement, most procurement systems around the world were created and dominated by a fixation on low price. Transparent, low price shootouts. Desiree talked about meat, the most economically advantageous tender, but that's an exception to low price prioritization. So procurement officials around the world have been fixated on the lowest price. Legislators, politicians love claiming that they're going to save money in procurement, but that ignores the fundamental consumer-based approach to purchasing. Reach into your wallet, anything that you buy, your home, your car, your clothes, your food, your computer, whatever you buy, there's almost nothing you buy where the only thing you care about is cost. You care about the value proposition. Did I get value for my money? Did I get my money's worth? Am I happy with my transaction? There is a global movement for standardization of procurement data and it has not yet embraced the need to take into account the consumer-based approaches. Now, here's where it gets really frustrating. Not only do we focus on low purchase prices and the tyranny of low price distracts us from value for money and customer satisfaction, but we focus on the transaction at the time of purchase, not over the life of the use. So for example, why do some people lease automobiles versus purchase automobiles? Well, they've made a value decision that they don't need that legacy cost. They understand that on a year by year basis, that decision might make sense to them economically. This is what drives us to life cycle. Now, let me also be clear on nomenclature. In the literature, you will see the terms life cycle cost, total cost of ownership, total ownership cost, and other iterations there. They're all slightly different. I have no dog in that fight. All I want our leaders to think about is to stop thinking about what you paid at the time you made the purchase and think about whether the transaction had value over time. So classic life cycle analysis would be, yes, I include my purchase price, but I also include my transaction costs, which are enormous in public procurement. The ones that most of us are cognizant of are operating costs and maintenance costs. The one that most people don't think about is disposition costs because that can be a positive or a negative number. If you buy a high-end automobile and keep it for five years, you reduce your life cycle cost because at the end of the day, you're going to resell it and recoup some of your funds. That dramatically impacts your investment over the useful life of the product. But the challenge that we have is that even, even if, and this is a big if, we can get procurement experts to start thinking in terms of life cycle cost, we need to now interject, as Desiree was saying, externalities or what we call effects. We need to think about potential benefits to the environment or harms to the environment. Let me be more clear. In our lifetime, in almost every nation in the world, we have artificially deflated the cost of fossil and coal fueled solutions. And we have not included the negative externalities or the environmental harms. We were mostly trained to use the term externalities. I'm going to encourage my colleagues and many of you to start using the word effects instead. If you haven't read Raworth's wonderful book, Donut Economics, she makes, I think, the best or most compelling case for effects instead of externalities. But the question is, 
as you do your life cycle cost analysis, particularly at the planning phase, how do you justify the price premium you will pay to not purchase the fossil fuel solution? That's the challenge that we all face. In other words, we have to proactively answer the question, what will I get for the price premium if I don't purchase the low price solution? Or in other words, how much more do I have to pay for lesser emissions or carbon reduction? And is it worth it? Well, the answer is it's worth it. But if I can't quantify and point to it, I can't get the kind of change I need. All of which brings me back to change management. This is the elephant in the room. When I worked at the White House over 20 years ago, I had a senior colleague who said, I really have no concern about changing the law and the policy. The only way you can change behavior and procurement is to wait for the existing workforce to retire and hire new people with different attitudes. That's a pretty dark view of the world. But change management is hard. It is really hard. And we have seen how significantly difficult it is to make people think and behave differently. My personal belief is unless we change our, our performance measurement regime, unless we measure differently and focus on different outcomes, we can't do it. So yes, we have to mandate and prioritize sustainable procurement in all the different ways that Desiree spoke about. So yes, we legislate, we regulate, but we need to change the rules of the game. We need to evaluate procurement officials based on whether they are achieving the goals that matter. And therefore maybe the new administration will help here. But this requires leadership. So you have to find the right people and you have to empower them. I can wave my arms all I want, but I can't make tens of thousands of procurement officials behave differently. But in order for them to behave differently, I have to educate them. I have to highlight success stories. I have to have a conversation. I need a nomenclature and a vocabulary that currently does not exist in my regulations, in my training programs, in my evaluation criteria. We need different words and focus on those words. We need to create communities of practice and we need to have certification programs as well. But let me just close with one small thing. One of the best lessons I learned in the White House over 20 years ago is that the most effective way to really get change management is to highlight the behavior that you want. One of the least expensive ways we can change behavior is to find the success stories and publicly reward and celebrate those people. Turn them into profits. Have them in the newspapers and on television. Have them standing next to senior political officials. Have them tell their stories so that their colleagues ask themselves, how can I get all that attention? Well, you can get all that attention by doing the good things this person did. But let me be unequivocally clear. Change management is a challenge, as is everything else we've talked about. I'm going to briefly uh, just wrap up here. If you're interested in any of these issues from a U.S. procurement standpoint, uh, I have a light piece that I put in the major trade magazine in the United States in the fall with my colleague Marcus Spidel called Warming Up the Sustainable Procurement. We were basically just trying to get the conversation started. Another fascinating database is the Clean Database. And I've given you the link there for our proposal, which talks about all these issues, sustainable public procurement, mandates, metrics, and incentives to overcome the tyranny of low purchase prices. But again, I think these are fascinating issues and I look forward to not only hearing from my colleagues, but working with all of you in the future. Thank you so much, Steve, for this um, insight um, and for, for this um, highlighting of the point of change management and of, um, of how to integrate um, these externalities and the importance of it. So I see Roberto is back. Um, let me see whether he, um, he is online and live um, in a couple of seconds. Otherwise, I would give the word to Mark um, if he needs time to set up. 
Roberto, um, would you like to present now or shall I first give the word to Mark? I take this as I give the work first <laughs> to Mark, and I think um, it will go well together because Mark is an expert and a celebrated icon of change man management in Switzerland, and he is um, certainly um, very worst um, when it comes to um, change management and how we do that in public procurement. I give over to Mark. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to see you all again especially the US colleagues, if I might call Desiree, which is fundamentally Swiss that way too. And Roberto, all people I long for decades, I'm so happy to see you again, including the audience, of course. I will speak about the paradigm shift from competition based on price to competition based on quality in Swiss public procurement law as a precondition for green public procurement and innovation. So the setup for the presentation is, I will try to describe mindset on public procurement policy. That, that's exactly what Steven Schooner drives us and, and it fits perfectly well. And then the Swiss reform of the regulation on public procurement keywords, uh, quality issues, sustainability and innovation, because I think competition based on quality and innovation are intrinsically linked, but I'll come to that later. And then also in terms of policy issues, we should discuss emergency protectionism. That's uh, our minister of uh, uh, economy advocating for that. Fortunately enough, the Ministry of Finance is strictly opposed and is, is maintaining open markets. So that's also inside the Swiss government, the kind of uh, <laughs> fight, okay. And then at the end, no green recovery plan without fostering sustainable public procurement. It's exactly the same as Stephen said about the Joe Biden administration plans. So we will come to pretty much the same uh, topics again. So I'll try to present you different layers. It's like an archeologic, you have to see where it's black, the city has been burned. And the point is that of each of those layers, you take the things you found and you put them together. And the same thing is true for public procurement. They're speaking to people, after a certain time, you know which pattern of mindset they belong to, and, and you can define different layers to describe what they think. The layer one and the oldest in, in Switzerland is by Swiss. So internal market not really stimulated, market opening not the main focus, political environment favoring protectionism, favoritism, collusion of bidders, Yes, we call that in German filz. So yes, that's layer one. Then layer two, that's what happened in the 90s. Steven Skirner described this where green public procurement aspects were, were demolished in the US regulation. This is no coincidence because the same thing happened in Europe and in Switzerland because at the time, people were saying, hey guys, what we need to succeed is open market, competition based on price and best value for is not so important, but money is important. <laughs> so that's the layer two thing, neoliberal of the 90s. And the layer three is what we focus now is the government procurement agreement 2012, the European Union directives 2014, and the new Swiss regulation of public procurement saying, hey guys, the 90s were not ideal as an incentive system. What we need is governance, preventing corruption, competition based on quality, sustainability, and innovation. So that's a layer three thing. The problem is that there are Lots of disguised layer one people arguing as they were layer three. So there are people advocating sustainability, but if they were really asked what they want is protectionism. And, and those things we have to distinguish in order 
to make clear which person belongs really to which layer. And there are considerable differences. We will come back to that later. So if I analyze the European surroundings on public policy and public procurement, I would say I can describe the way from layer two to layer three, 90s layer two. Nowadays, we are layer three, thanks to the new directive, thanks to the new government procurement agreement, which has been described inside the WTO as a unicorn thing because it's years ahead of its time. That's interesting, isn't it? And exactly the same is true for the European Union directives. And now Switzerland is not ahead of time, but following <laughs> and saying, okay, we belong to this too. That's the interesting point. And especially true, this is for the WTO, they did a symposium on sustainable procurement. This would have been unthinkable 20 years ago, just unthinkable. And now it's reality and people are moving forward towards sustainable public procurement, especially Canada and Europe. Okay. And that's why the new government procurement agreement says, hey guys, you could consider environmental characteristics as an award criterion according to WTO government procurement agreement, which is new, which wasn't explicitly mentioned in the GPA 1994. So that's an interesting development too. So WTO evolved, European Union evolved, and Switzerland evolved more or less in parallel. That's interesting, really. And so what you can see on the European level is the link between competition based on quality, sustainability and innovation. They all go together. That's the European concept. And it's also to, to admit it frankly, the Swiss one, we had copy paste that more or less from the EU, but we don't admit it because it doesn't sell politically. <laughs> So that's the point. So, okay, and why is innovation that important? Because if we go for the lowest price, who wins the battle? China. And we want Europe to win the battle. And that's why we are going for competition based on quality, innovation and sustainability, of course. That's industry policy. That's not for to please NGOs. That's perhaps important to... To, to, to have in mind in order to assess why we found majorities for the whole thing. So according to the new Swiss law, sustainability is aim and purpose of the law itself as an integrated part of best value for money. This is a breakthrough. Article two, aim and purpose of the law, best value for money in terms of sustainability. Great, just great. So, and then what we have as a second new thing is the notion of most advantageous tender. As Desiree mentioned already in her presentation, it's not anymore the most economically advantageous tender, but the most advantageous tender, meaning quality is more important than price. And that's really a game changer because this doesn't address reglementation, regulation, but it addresses the procurement culture. And it's exactly those behavior changes Stephen has in mind. Changing the notion for how to award bids is addressing procurement culture. It's a behavior thing because there are margins of appreciations there. That's not the judge to say how you, what you have to buy. That's not the judge's decision. There's a margin of appreciation. And that's why procurement culture is so important. And what, that's why it's a behavior thing, exactly as Stephen told us. I mean, it couldn't be more striking. That's exactly the same issues we, we are dealing with. I mean, it's fascinating. Okay, next one. 
This means that we have a greater variety of awarding criteria, including life cycle costing and internalization of green externalities. It's more than total cost of ownership, it's internalization. And then what we have is the most advantageous tender, which means in a behavior style message, hey guys, change your behavior, don't go for the lowest price, bust it for the best value. And then for money is the second step, but the first important thing is best value. So that's really a mindset change. And now what does this mean for us in the future? Switzerland should, considering the importance of its expert industry, not envisage a concept of a post-COVID emergency protectionism. A buy-Swiss strategy is not what I would, let's say, recommend, but instead a green recovery plan should apply. So we should follow the European model and saying, hi, build back better in Europe means green recovery. But we mean the same, build back better in that term is absolutely transposable in a green recovery concept. And it's pretty much the same as the Joe Biden uh, administration has in mind. So sustainable public procurement must be seen as a key element of every strategy on green recovery. And the problem is that the normal public official or politician says this public procurement stuff, that it's much too technical. I don't can't get out the political argument out of this. And this needs to be changed. We need to find words to make public procurement a broader discussed issue. If not, the whole thing will fail. We have to find other messages to address broader decision makers and not just the specialists. And then we come to a next level discussion on how to use public procurement as part of a recovery plan or as a build back better strategy. So that's it then. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Mark, for the Swiss perspective on um, sustainability and the paradigm shift or change management um, from uh, price to sustainability. Um, so now I would like to give um, the word to Roberto. Um, Roberto, do you want to share your slides or shall I share them for you? You are currently still unmuted. Uh, muted, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if you could uh, uh, share them, uh, that will make my life much easier. Thank you. Since yes. uh, I'm having already some issues. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. And I will okay. draw up your slides. So uh, thank you, everyone, for having me. This is nice to see uh, people like Mark was saying, really old friends. We have been around for a while, but also uh, to talk with the new generation in public procurement and uh, notably in sustainable public procurement. Um, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so I will be focusing on the EU. Sorry for uh, I had uh, clearly some connection problem and I missed most of Steve's presentation. Next one, please. Uh, so uh, how is uh, in the EU? Uh, Mark has already highlighted there. There has been a kind of a conflict, long lasting between uh, an approach which is even uh, kind of before the neoliberal approach but an approach to the internal market we just wanted to discuss about money because money is something that we can measure easily we are afraid of discrimination if you make it there are some very smart colleagues of mine that are still very much opposed to sustainable public procurement saying, okay, 
this is going to make the whole business so complicated and it is going to open the door uh, to protectionism. In, in other guys, not open, but still. So internal market, including internal market orthodoxy and sustainability. Um, how it is uh, evolving, which are, I think it might be interesting uh, for uh, you. Uh, just a few words about the actors. Next, please. Who is um, really involved in this? And uh, uh, of course, you don't need to uh, be schooled in EU law and institutions, but there are different actors and they actually fight. They are not all going uh, well together. So we have to consider at least three actors, the council, basically where the member states are represented, the commission, the commission is the technocratic government, if you want, and uh, the court of justice. And uh, as uh, Mark has already highlighted, the Court of Justice was much instrumental in sustainable public procurement in the EU. It is thanks, it is thanks to some judgment, and he was already recalling Concordia Bass and Mark Savela, that uh, the commission, the commission is bit the guardian of the orthodoxy. Just a small uh, anecdote, if you want, I was involved, uh, it's more than 10 years ago, uh, in drafting the uh, buying, the first buying social guide. And we were just consultants. We did our job with the ITC ALO. And then for three years, nothing happened. We handed our work, nothing happened. And so you talk to the people in the commission, what is happening? Uh, we are talking with internal market, is stuff, is stuff, is stuff. Then after three years, the, the guide comes out very much as we drafted it. Just some punctuation changed, but not the punctuation that you change the meaning. But this means that it was just vetted. I think it's kind of the whole inquisition. They really want to vet your book very carefully before you publish it. And the Court of Justice was uh, pushing the council, the council is depending. Some member states very pro sustainability, other member states they couldn't care less. Small and big human enterprises at times lobbying against sustainability, some member states listening more to small and medium enterprises. So, a mixed picture. Next, please. And uh, we come uh, to do the 2014 directives. I'm just building uh, on uh, Mark. Uh, that was the old Horizon 2020 perspective. Oh yes, the parliament, you are right, uh, Mark. This time the parliament was very much instrumental. Uh, traditionally, it is not very much active, but in the last round, the 2014 directives, the Tarabella Commission was just uh, very active because of this, thanks Mark, Horizon 2020 policy. And so the 2014 directives include a number of rules. I don't have time to go through all of them. I just uh, want uh, to stress a couple of things. There is even a little bit hidden in Article 18.2, the sustainability principle in the 2014-24 directive. It was a little bit hidden until last year, the Court of Justice, again, the team judgment said, okay, sustainability is a core principle, the same as transparency and so on. We are still waiting to see possible development of this, but it is quite uh, a blunt statement, I would say. And of course, uh, labels, which are very, very important 
in practice and LCC our criteria we will talk uh, about this just to keep in mind that now because of covid and greta and everything we have uh, the european green deal there is there has been a shift in the political approach a shift in the political approach in the commission that is very uh, very relevant next one please what is the problem or if you want the compromise point between internal market orthodoxy and sustainability it is objectivity it is differently worded in different uh, provisions but there is a, this idea you can do this but this can't be just greenwashing or things like that it must be objective and this is the like 16th 17th century scientific uh, revolution this is not about fake news or alternative facts no 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 it is objective this is something that you need uh, to measure why because uh, you need to avoid a lot of stuff including uh, favor discrimination and so on next please LCC, this is uh, uh, going to be kind of uh, last point. One thing I want uh, uh, to stress, Mark has already uh, told us this. Keep in mind, look, many of these rules in the directives, they are not mandatory for the member states. We have some mandatory rules in other specific uh, um a legal text like uh, energy efficiency in office uh, appliance and things uh, like that most of these is not mandatory but it is enabling enabling the member states and the member states are taking these differently first point second important point i want to stress Oh, I, I really like archaeology. And the incredible thing there are, and I think we are lucky, well, to a certain extent, uh, we are uh, lucky because we live in interesting times. 2014 seems really ages ago, including from the point of view of sustainable public procurement. The Commission is uh, uh, saying, at least, that it is going to work on mandatory SPP criteria, mandatory for all the member states. And it is in a lot of initiatives, including the Farm to Fork initiative. They are talking about mandatory sustainable catering for public schools and things uh, like that. But back to 2004, the directive, this is not mandatory you can include in your calculation mark has already explained this a lot of stuff including environmental ex uh, externalities including is not in the provision it is in the recital a bit more shy uh, social externalities next one An important thing is the methodology. Remember, objectivity. Where do I took uh, this objectivity? There is uh, someone, uh, also people doing research uh, in uh, Switzerland. They are talking about, I think it's kind of UN environment or OECD talk, materiality uh, to avoid washing washing we are more like objectively they must be verifiable and they must not favor anyone they must be accessible to every 
economic operator, so not, not any kind of proprietary IP criteria. And, okay, not overdue. Reasonable effort by a tenderer. There is the warning for uh, SMEs, but also GPA, uh, let's say the commission in the uh, past round, at times, uh, not to say I don't want this, was saying, oh, this is not allowed under the GPA. So this multi-layer global public procurement governance and legislation is a bit binding. What is the idea? You need to develop methodologies. How it is working? Next one. And I'm almost there. In practice, uh, okay, this is brush advertisement uh, with Marta and uh, we had a book last year and there are a lot of uh, information if you mind uh, on a number of uh, member states. Uh, next one, please. It's kind of a, a bit less than a success. Bit less of a success so far because it is really work intensive to develop this criteria. We had one semi-mandatory LCC approach in the EU that was about vehicles, cars, and so on. It was scrapped just two years ago because contracting authorities were finding this uh, too difficult uh, to manage. Uh, but uh, we are uh, start, well, we are starting now, we are in recruiting phase. So if anyone is interested, there is uh, the link. A new research in this project, uh, we, will, we are hiring 15 PhD students to work on different aspects of uh, sustainable public procurement. And uh, one aspect for sure is how do we measure these benefits? Because uh, one slide I could uh, see uh, by Desiree was how much worth is a human life? Well, okay. Uh, that is not, uh, not so easy to measure. I know that in economics, uh, people has, have been working on this uh, for decades now. So I guess uh, there have been progress. I was shocked when I was uh, much younger, kind of 25 years ago. And I was uh, uh, just doing some research in the England. Uh, it was still in, the, uh, in our community. And uh, they had this methodology to calculate whether it was worth or not to build roundabouts. And uh, in these, uh, let's say, uh, cost benefit analysis, they factor in how many accidents we had at the specific crossroad. I don't remember the quote exactly, but human life was worth something like 20,000 pounds. And I was thinking, oh, I must be worth more. And someone, I uh, don't remember who told me, yes, listen, but if we put a high value on human life, every crossroad where someone died, we need to make a roundabout because it will cost less than our, uh, let's say, human life. So it is, I think, very difficult, especially for uh, social procurement, but worth investigating. And I'm very happy to be in the conversation. And uh, I'm very happy that this conversation will continue. Steve, you know very well that uh, uh, your university is partner in this uh, project. So there will be a lot of involvement. Thank you a lot and happy to uh, take questions. 
Thank you so much, Roberto, and thank you again for prioritizing this conference over uh, your teaching. Um, I'm very glad you could make it, and um, it was very nice to hear um, from the EU um, perspective, especially the work of the Court of um, Justice. I would like to say a few um, concluding remarks, and uh, for that matter, I would like to um, show the questions that I have prepared, prepared that might guide us a little bit through this conversation. Um, so um, I think I want to um, summarize um, uh, what we discussed so far, and I have a couple of uh, keywords um, in mind that, that were a, a red line, a silver lining through uh, the entire conversation here, and it is uh, change, change management, change from price and money to quality and sustainability, first point. Second point, how do we measure? objectivity, methodology. And th this is where the new research will come in. We have old measures like the value of statistical life, but we need to understand how do we apply it to sustainability? How do we apply it to public procurement? And do we have alternative methods to um, measure sustainability? And um, then lastly, um, I, I really like the phrase of, uh, of Steve, um, and I think this concludes um, the discussion very nicely. What gets measured gets managed. And so we need work towards measuring, towards having objective criteria. Um, and, um, and I would like to thank you very uh, much for being here. I will stop the recording, but I uh, would like to have uh, a discussion and invite also the audience um, and leave uh, the slides up so that um, we can all um, see the questions. And then I would like to open